When you focus on the breath, you're trying to stay in the present moment. But the present moment is not an isolated thing. It's connected with the past, connected with the future. So even though your primary interest is right here, still there are times when it's important that you think about the past, think about the future. To make sure that your ardency here in the present moment is going in the right direction. Alertness is what keeps you in touch with the present. Mindfulness is what keeps you in touch with the past. Remembering lessons from the past that might be useful for right now. And also remembering the basic framework we're trying to bring here. Those Four Noble Truths we chanted about just now. They're always relevant. They're connected with the question of what's skillful to do right now. Skillful being defined as what does not lead to suffering and actually leads away from suffering or stress. And some of the skillful things you've learned about, you've learned from others, and some you've learned from your own experience. As I, was, as I was saying this morning, not everything that looks good in the present moment is going to have good results. So we're not here to grok the present moment and figure out immediately with 100% trust that we will know what's the right thing to do. This is not the I Ching, where each moment is unique and distinct. We live in a causal framework that has a common pattern over time, and even though the pattern may be complex, still it's regular enough that you can learn from past mistakes and past right choices. And that's why mindfulness is so important and why it's so important that mindfulness is a fac faculty of memory. You're not sitting here trying to remember all these things all the time. but something comes up in the meditation, you're not sure about what you're doing, you might think back. What have you done in the past that's worked? What, ha what have you done in the past that hasn't worked? And see if it can give you some guidance. As for the future, that deals with our motivation. We're here shaping the present moment. What shape do you want to put it in? What shape is going to be good for your life and the life of the people around you down the line? so that when you're feeling lazy right now, how do you motivate yourself to really do the practice? Or if you know that something is skillful but you don't feel like doing it, how can you motivate yourself to do it if you're faced with something that you know is unskillful and that you want to do it? How can you talk yourself out of that? This is where your motivation is important. Thinking about the fact that your actions are not just a stick drawn in the water. They're going to have their impact. And particularly with a practice like this, where you're really trying to remake your mind, you have to have strong motivation. I was reading a very peculiar piece a while back, someone saying that putting a lot of effort in the practice requires strong motivation, and strong motivation requires a sense of self, and so it's a bad thing. So don't put any effort in. Well, it's couch potato philosophy. I mean, there are s skillful ways of formulating a sense of self or thinking about yourself, identifying things that you want and identifying things that you don't want. And these go into your motivation. And the primary motivation the Buddha recommends, of course, is heedfulness. The realization that your actions do make a difference, and if you're careless, the difference can go in a direction you don't want. That's to counteract the little voice inside that says, well, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Do you really want to suffer? 
Do you really want to miss out on the opportunity to get, get past suffering? You've got an opportunity right now. You don't know how much longer you're going to have it, but you do have it right now. So try to make the most of it, because you will benefit down the line. You benefit now, too. It may be difficult, but as the Buddha said, even if you're following the holy life with tears coming down your face, that's a practice, he says, that's unpleasant in the present, but it's going to lead to good things in the future. So even when it's difficult, you want to stick with it. Another motivating factor, of course, is compassion and goodwill, both for yourself and for people around you. This too is useful for counteracting the voice that says it doesn't matter. Or when you're dealing with someone, you might be dealing in an unskillful way, and the voice that says, well, they don't matter. They do matter. Because what you do to other people is going to come back. So a very good way of motivating yourself to do the skillful thing and avoid the unskillful thing is to develop thoughts of goodwill. Remember, that's the question of do other people deserve your goodwill? That's not the question. The question is can you trust yourself if you don't develop goodwill? It's primarily for the sake of your own skillfulness that you're developing these, these thoughts. Another good way of motivating yourself is to remember the great meditators of the past, either from the time of the Buddha or more recently. You read the biography, say, of John Mun, the autobiography of John Lee. You read John Mahabua's accounts of his practice and his Dharma talks. That's to counteract the voice that says, when you're tempted to do something unskillful, well, everybody does it. Well, no, not everybody does it. There have been people who've learned how to say no, and they've benefited as a result. It also counteracts the little voice that says, well, this is just the way I am. If you try to hold on to that idea, it's just going to kill your practice. You've got to keep remembering the way you are is a result of conditions, but you can change those conditions. But again, the great people of the past just didn't. It wasn't that, say, a John Munn was already an Arahant when he was born. He had defilements just like us. And the same with all the great teachers. Yet they realized if they didn't change, their attitudes didn't change their ways of thinking, didn't change their ways of practice. They were going to suffer, and they'd had enough. And that sense of when you're going to have enough is what kept them going. So that's a question you should take up instead of listening to the unskillful voices. Have you had enough suffering yet? How much more do you want? Another way of motivating yourself in the practice is the pair of qualities shame and pride. Shame has a bad name in modern culture. But we have to make a distinction between healthy and unhealthy shame. I was reading recently that someone saying that Buddhism doesn't really deal with the problem of shame very well, it doesn't recognize how debilitating it can be. Well, there are people who were debilitated by their sense of shame. Remember the monks who committed suicide. And the Buddha deals with this issue. And what it comes down to is the shame that if it's focused on actions, it's very helpful. If it's focused on thoughts, it's very helpful. If it's focused on just you as a person, it's not. To learn how to make that distinction. So that when you think about doing something unskillful, you realize it's beneath me. This is why shame is connected to pride. 
You've come this far as a human being. You don't want to drop further back down. It just counteracts a little the voice. I said, well, what's wrong with that? Where am I talking about everybody doing it? Well, you need a certain amount of, as Ananda says, conceit on the practice. We're not here just to be ordinary people. We're here to think about the people who have gained awakening. They can do it. Why can't we? Why can't we make something of ourselves, something special? Not that we're trying to show off to anybody else, but we'd like to be special in our own minds, special in the care with which we choose our actions, special in the way we think about the consequences of our actions, special in the kind of happiness that we want. So these are some of the ways in which you want, might want to think about the future as you're trying to focus on the present. Another useful motivation, another application of heedfulness, is when the voice in the mind says, I've got to worry about this, I've got to worry about that, I don't have time to meditate. You don't know how much longer you're going to be alive. You don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you do know that which, whatever unexpected things come up, you're going to need mindfulness, you're going to need alertness, you're going to need discernment. You're going to need a strong determination to do what is skillful. Well, that's what we're working on right now. So what we're doing right now is the best preparation for the future. And the purpose of this future thinking, of course, is to turn your attention back to the present moment. So you can develop the qualities of mindfulness and alertness and ardency without being distracted. Taking what you've learned from the past, applying it to the present, and knowing that it's going to be good for the future. These things are all connected.